Welcome to the Act React podcast, where we explore improvisation through conversations with remarkable artists. I'm the host, Daniel Burkholder, a dance artist based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Potawatomi peoples. In this episode, I have the pleasure of sharing a conversation I had with Dr. S. Amare. Dr. Ray is a dance artist who explores jazz dance, improvisation, technology, community building, and healing in countless ways. It was a pleasure to get more familiar with her work that she does out in the world and how she is making such a positive difference. Here's a bit more about Dr. Ray. Dr. S. Amare is the creator of Embodiology, a movement method based on West African principles of human communications that leads to human flourishing. She's a professor of dance and founder of the Africana Institute of Creativity, Recognition, and Elevation at UC Irvine. Embodiology's distinctive breath-informed rhythmic movement and music concepts have shown evidence-based efficacy in elevating vitality, well-being, and resilience, along with embodied activation of community responsibility. Her virtual classes, Joy in Motion, began with breath work supporting everyday pe people to transform their indoor spaces into experiences of co-liberation. Dr. Ray has been a guest speaker or lecturer at the United Nations, Institute of Advanced Studies, TEDx, and other globally renowned organizations. Her roots in art making have been informed by collaborations with artists, including um, Wynton Marcellus, Bobby McFerrin, Mohisola Obedoya, and Derek Burnell. Embodyology is a registered trademark, rendering its creator and benefactories ethical responsibility to return acknowledgement, acknowledgement and resources to the AU community in Ghana, where its principles were uncovered. Her writing about emb embodyology is published in edited volumes by Rutledge and Oxford Books. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Let's begin. Hi, Ama. Thank you so much for joining me on Act React. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, to meet you. We had a brief conversation the other day, and I'm I'm looking forward to getting to know more about you and your approach to improvisation. Great. Thank you for the invitation, Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Really excited. So I, I always start with this kind of more broad question with everyone, and so just kind of in a general sense. How does improvisation kind of show up in your work, in your life, in your performing, in your teaching? Like, how does improv, improvisation manifest itself for you? Sure. I think most people that are committed to improvisation would say that it is how I do everything. It's the way I relate. It's the way I value connection with other people. There's an openness to mm. novelty and to that which arises in the moment. And I seek to share these values in my work and then in the greater task of living. Yes, I, that is, it's, I, I feel, especially with improvisational artists, there is this kind of going back and forth between how we make work, how we are, in our case, on stage, and how we try to live our lives day to day of kind of with a certain level of curiosity and spontaneity. Yes, most definitely. And I think the more I share the work that I do, the more I teach these ideas of improvisation, the more I actually value, value it as a, as a way to live. Mm that's the kind of feedback that you hear in between the sort of aha moments of being in the dance studio like how it then renders itself in the everyday and in many ways some of the things that i do i choose to have participants engage with those ideas outside of the space of, of the studio mm -hmm. Does that, does that engaging things outside the studio, does that happen in terms of like when you're teaching your, 
say university students or does that happen when you're teaching like workshops to outside of the university setting both like how does that how does that look like on a on a practical or kind of sure. direct way so yeah I teach in bodyology and bodyology is a movement methodology that renders itself as performance and in terms of improvisation the core of it is really about the spontaneous but it's also about developing awareness layers of awareness which i speak of and in that development of awareness that renders itself beyond the the basic of our five senses in the sort of western construct of our senses uh, we engage in what we think of as sensory discovery and mm. so that's when we we're building our connections to our intuition and our imagination and we do those things outside of the space of the studio because that's where we can respond to if you will an everyday situation in in the home for example and reimagine it just for a small moment mm -hmm. it, and then take that moment and bring it back to the studio setting so yeah so this space of sense what we call sensory discovery or rediscovery um is is an important uh, important place of of discovering the sense of play as well yeah that's great um i love that that term the sensory discovery it's like opening up like what else what else is possible by sensing it in different ways um i wonder if you could talk a little bit about like when you when you use that term sensory discovery like are there certain exercises or frameworks that you might offer either for people in the studio or outside the studio to use like um i'm really interested in like getting into the nitty gritty of how people teach improvisation so i don't know if there's a specific like exercise or framework or score that you might offer a class or a group of people to to work on their sensory discovery and what's coming up for me right now i'm thinking about music for some reason i i listen to music a lot uh, music is a very big part of embodyology it's based, uh, grounded in African principles of performance and community. And when I think about music and this idea of sensory discovery, we, we think often about listening to music with our ears. And as opposed to simply engaging with sound, with the, what we think of as, as audition, going into novel inquiry like thinking about where you feel the resonance of sound in your body like where it shows up yeah how it feels and maybe putting words to that feeling or not but just again opening up awareness as to what that music feels like and where does it locate itself it's hmm. great yeah i wanted to kind of delve into embodyology because this is this is a, a form a structure a framework a methodology that you've created and i guess maybe this would be a nice time since you brought it up to kind of I don't know if, if you want to say something about how how this came to be for you what kind of influences brought it together um kind of what your goals are with it just kind of whatever you want to say about it since since it is something that people can actually go and look at and study and and explore sure well i've been engaged in improvisation for many decades and for many decades i've been working with musicians and musicians particularly jazz musicians and also with that approaching dance through the lens of jazz and jazz being a dance form that's also got many tentacles, but ultimately its roots are within the African and African diasporic ways of knowing. 
And so my interest in improvisation really comes through that pathway. Um, I have studied many other approaches to improvisation, which I enjoy. However, there, was no, there wasn't a space that was really visible to me that focused on understanding what that ecology of jazz is. Many people use and work with jazz musicians because they're nimble improvisers. But actually, mm. what, is, what, are, what are the currents that engage their creativity? So that was, in some ways, the starting point. Yeah. So from there, I sought to, to really understand it from a, maybe a philosophical point of view, not simply mm -hmm. an aesthetic uh, place, which then led me to, to other questions that were not being resolved for my, un, for my level of curiosity, if you will in looking at dance and music in the Western Hemisphere. So I chose to then go to the source, the source meaning to look at dance and music on the continent of Africa, which I have been studying African dance forms, maybe, maybe for about 20 years, but not as an African dancer. My training is largely within the Western ballet, modern, jazz, etc. So yeah. having studied African dance on the continent, I was also curious to see how the dance and music was actually practiced in the community, not simply rendering itself on a performance stage. And with that, I was also studying for my PhD. So all these things congealed my interest, yeah. my choice to, to to go on and study further and what i found was that i needed to engage as much with music as i did the dance in order to understand the spaces and the places that were spontaneous were created in the moment i also needed to really have a deeper appreciation for and understanding of what the conversations were between the dancers and musicians. Mm -hmm. And sort of out of that, I saw a very clear alliance that went outside of the dance and the music, which was language. Mm -hmm. So language in specific cultures and i'm going to speak about anlo eve since this is the the main community and group of peoples that i've studied uh, in order to decipher what is now rendered as embodyology i i got to play and dance in order to learn the traditional dances and in that process i learned that the music was not simply notes in space but it was actually spoken language it was oral music that was actually articulating and communicating directly with the audience so that was the beginnings of understanding that rhythm was not simply pattern but it was also tone pitch cadence space mm -hmm. And that is the meta generator of improvisation as relates to what I teach in embodyology. Yeah. So I'll pause there. There's a lot more to it, but that yeah. gives you the, the entryway. Yeah, that's that was that was a great framing of kind of where where how it developed. And so it sounds like you're pulling from this lineage, this African diasporic lineage, um, going back or going to Africa and studying there, relating it to the jazz, dance and jazz music that maybe you were working with previously. And, and then how does it, so when you're in the studio now, what, how, how does that manifest? How does all that information manifest into working with students to learn how to do this form? Like what are the what are the important things? What are the main principles that really you want people to understand when they're studying 
and getting maybe getting ready to perform or just you know studying in a class with you sure well the first uh, principle is is what i call dynamic rhythm and so we spend a good if, if i'm talking about university course and i'm teaching sure. for 10 weeks a quarter that we would typically have a UCI, we would spend the first third of that quarter working on rhythm based exercises. And um, those rhythm based exercises bring to our understanding how we how how comfortable we are with rhythm. And then it helps us to stretch ourselves to become more facile with rhythm and aware of its value. Mm. Because in many cases, dancers in a typical university setting are used to counting. And that is what rhythm may or may not mean to them. It's points in space. Mm. And to revive a sensibility that's connected to their breath and to their heart and to all of the layers of rhythm that exist in the world. Uh, and I really do mean that from, from us being bipedal instruments to the seasons, to uh, the renderings of day and night, like everything that makes the the process of becoming and the ending of life is based on cycles and rhythm yeah and uh and effectively this becomes dynamic and a polyrhythmic um sh uh, uh, what would i say uh, a, a, an ongoing shifting um kind of effervescence so there's an aliveness with engaging in rhythm yeah and polyrhythm and speaking through rhythm in your movement and this also means having a really powerful connection with space and silence we only have reference to pattern and rhythm because there are spaces between the events so that is also an enormous uh, awakening for dancers to really think about speech language and the ways in which when we we're expressing ourselves that we also use intonation we also use pauses we also use exclamation we, so that all those renderings of tone and pitch and cadence into the entire body. And then we, as mentioned earlier, we engage in a practice of uh, really getting into an understanding of our sense making apparatus. And, and we do this through quiet work very quiet work of, 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 a medita of a meditative nature. And so we begin every session in a very slow down place so mm. that we can really begin to sense through our breath and changing the calibration of our nervous system because most of the time we're rushing from one space to another. So yeah. actually getting into a place where we settle from that place of settling we emerge with really strong connection between our breath and movement so breath and movement are critical and this relationship between breath and effort are also a a, a, a way in which we continue to support the challenge of improvising so breath being a, a type of inoculation for stress. So as we are challenged, as we breathe, as so we breathe with more intention. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I love, I love that. I mean, the, the, the arc that you just talked about from this dynamic rhythm all the way to, to stillness and breath just seems like this beautiful arc of, of possible ways of, of moving, of being in the body. And, and yet, of course, they're all deeply intertwined with one another. And, and I also really appreciate you kind of differentiating like these different elements of rhythm, right? Because often for me, like when I think of rhythm, I think it's kind of very, not very sophisticated. Um, and hearing like, oh, right. Like when we're talking rhythm, we're not just talking about the pattern of the rhythm, but also all of those other elements that you mentioned, the tone, the, the, the kind of yes timber whatever whatever all the, the different elements of it are is is also important in terms of the meaning of it and Absolutely. and so i'm curious like for you how does how do all those different elements how do that manifest in in your body or in the ways that you express rhythm in that that multifaceted way yeah i mean the body is a polyrhythmic entity and we have so so many you know <laughs> unending possibilities of how how we are in any moment right like right now you know my mouth is animating but so are my hands and so are my feet there's a polyrhythm happening right now as i'm speaking to you right yeah. so it's just awareness like when we actually think of our bodies as as it is it's, it's more than a body it's a head it's a moving mouth it's two eyes it's small fingers it's shoulders it's my front of my breast here it's my seat it right there's so much yeah. there's so much and so again every part of us has has the possibility to be animated and articulated and uh, and, and and attention paid to to it mm -hmm. Um, which is the gift, I think, of of slowing down, that one can do that. And and then the pressure of time. This is also how how rhythm shows up in the work. It's also part of a pressure, right? A really active pressure. And you can think of pressure as stress, right? Mm -hmm. So rhythm is also a stressor, which is why the breath comes in. And that's a, a really interesting game that one plays with oneself, right? Oh, I have to stay tuned in to time and how I'm dispensing, articulating my body. And I've got to do this without falter, right? When we're improvising, mm -hmm. don't stop and say, well, this isn't good. You have to keep moving and evaluating and moving and questioning and moving and relating and pausing. But the pause is not empty. That's the beautiful thing in this world. Like the stop isn't empty and dancers forever want to just keep moving just like a tap just yeah. it just goes yeah. but to really come to an understanding that stillness isn't empty so yeah. what is stillness it's it's always breath right unless you're <laughs> unless you're holding it right, right. and it is an amplification of your presence uh, there we go. That's that's really interesting. So, amplification of presence that that makes me want to ask about performance. Mm -hmm. right? Performance. We could think of performance in in a way as an amplification of our presence, um, or a concentration of it, or something. And mm -hmm. when you're working, whether we keep it under the frame of embodyology or not, but um but we can but when we when you go into performance either say performing yourself i don't these may be different answers but wh whether you're performing yourself or you're directing a group of people to perform improvisationally like what do you how much do you plan what do you know what don't you know like we like in i often talk about scores like what's the score but you may use a different word but like what's the what's the plan how much I love, is I love that. I love that question. Um, just because, you know, many people come to improvisation if they've done improvisation before with this question of the score. I said, there's no score. There's no score. 
the score is you. That's it. The score <laughs> is here. Yeah. There's no score. Um, meaning that we have a by this point, when we are yeah. performing, or we have awoken the senses. We have awoken relationship with others. We have awoken connection, understanding, relationship with musicians. We have awoken connection with audience, people who may be observing. And then we breathe, we slow down, and we do it. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So it's the, the, the study of the form is about kind of preparing oneself to enter that theater space that performance space open and ready and responsive yes yes you know and it's i think has often been helpful to you know because dancers do have a a ritual of performance that comes before they've worked with me or even done right. in with anyone right and so they're used to a certain kind of drill uh you know their tendus or their achapes or their you know whatever it is that they do and i come to see that actually the the container for the performances is, is is that simple place of connecting to your groundedness and to the people that you're performing with Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we enact maybe some some types of games, if you will, to 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 heighten us, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and and also, yeah, that that quiet space is yeah. also really important. Certainly, is for me. Yeah. I often go missing. Like, where is she? She's <laughs> she's on stage next. She's off. She's just just yeah yeah. So I think there's a couple of questions come to mind. The the first one is as you're so you've been you're getting ready or you're working with people to get ready to go on into this open space of performance and how much work how I think I kind of know the answer or I'm I'm assuming the answer but in that process of getting ready how important is it that the musicians are in the space working with you and the dancers before you go into this performance? Like, do they have the same kind of prep experience or is it is it different? Depends what type of musicians are you talking about? Student musicians who, who yeah. are new to organization or yeah. musicians that we've just met this week? Um, uh, to have a great performance with musicians, they they need to be tuned in to mm -hmm. to the dancers and understand and us to understand what it is that they are observing and how they're interpreting. So we need to have had some exchange over a period of time, I would say, um, and that could be short. I mean, yeah. done wonderful performances where we just had one rehearsal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, the best improvisers just show up and just like, okay, we're good. We're, and we're just in that listening space, right? You don't give everything out in the first three minutes. You're taking your time and, you know, uh, and testing and uh, playing in the true sense of play. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely had similar experiences where, you know, you kind of show up and you m even just meet the the other people you're performing with, musicians or whatever. And it's a really beautiful performance because, because everyone is tuned in yes. and then I had the opposite of course i remember one incident specifically where there is this stand-up bass player and his idea was just to play as many notes as he could the whole time <laughs> it was just like bah, 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 bah. and we're like whoa where's the space for us yeah. like it was all about just him filling every nook and cranny and so yeah. that's that's can be challenging yeah that's unfortunate i mean i mean yeah bad choice <laughs> sorry <laughs> you know, it happens right i mean this is you know one of many performances it's all good so <laughs> so in that case in this case what constitutes a good performance um that's a very hard question to I, answer i thought it would be <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the audience uh in the end is going to be the determiner 
Mm-hmm. Um, because ultimately, if I'm inside of the performance and performing, I'm just in it. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I will be my provocative self to shift things if I feel like, ah, it's not, mm, not quite, yeah. what do I need to do to, um, and others may similarly um, be provocative. Um, so I think the audience, I mean, when I've been in recently uh, spaces where the audience isn't a typical dance audience, for example, like the, the group of people that uh, are interested to, to see an unfolding and uh, to, to hear them say things like, wow, that looked like magic. Like, mm. how did you do that? Like, you know, just their sort of sense of awe and wonder. So um, the audience is very important in the work that, that we do with Embodyology. The audience is actually a protagonist. They're not simply just receiving. Um, so their experience and, and how we respond to them um, is, is, is threaded in. And, and for students, if you will, if you want to go back to that container of our sure. students at the university, that can be a very new experience for them to, to, mm-hmm. to think about the audience in that very um, affirmed way and in that very present way. Um, it's always interesting to invite people into the studio for the first time and see how the students will back up and almost back on, dance on the back of the room, you know. Um, right. It's always interesting, and then then we reconfigure that, and we think about okay, what what does the audience do for us? Mm-hmm. Why are we in the same space, right? And we start to to undo some of the 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 things that that maintain this sort of rigid fourth wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, embodyology shows up, obviously when you're working with dancers to train them, it manifests itself as performance. How else does, or are you taking embodyology out in the world? Is there any other context in which you apply this methodology or imagine it being brought out into the wider world? Well, certainly I, since, since 2020, I've been teaching a class virtually and it's called Joy in Motion. Mm-hmm. And it began in the heart of the pandemic, right at the beginning, actually, March 2020, when we were all told we had to leave campus. And I was actually on sabbatical and I was isolated where I was. And there were no people around. I was on a retreat and the retreat center staff all went home. They said, you can stay here as long as you like. It was the most... And so I stayed in this retreat center because I was writing and I started a virtual class because I needed to connect with people and people needed connection. So from there, I introduced the ideas centered in embodyology. There are six principles and the third principle is Cecilia Lama, which renders itself as inner sensing and balance. Mm-hmm. And in that virtual space, I recalibrated my eye to really tune into people's breathing and how breath and movement was connected or not connected. And it's really fascinating to observe the difference and that I could detect that. And so we we engage, engaged in meditative breath work, and then we moved into movement and sort of, I also created what we call fractal code sequences. So there are times where I use movement that's organized in a, in a, in a linear sense of mm-hmm. you know, the, the movement as a, a group of themes put together. And then from that, we then explored ideas. And so this became a way for people who were not at all in, in, in the world of art 
to come into the space. And I was curious because more and more people who I really did not expect people who I knew were coming. I would invite people because that was the time where we could reach out yeah. in ways. And, and sure enough, um, the, the work really supported them to feel less isolated, uh, to be in community with others, and also reimagine themselves in a way, because I was really concerned that we weren't going to be indoors and afraid and anxious. And then at the end of this pandemic, we would go back out into the world afraid and of limited scope. I was like, that's not going to happen. We're going to do the anti version of that. And so, you know, we used our imaginations in our in our spaces. We used the physical spaces that we were in and used them in a way that that supported us creating and I think it made a safe space for people that wouldn't necessarily come to a dance studio. Yeah, yeah. And so that class has continued. So I, I called it virtual embodiology in, in the beginning, um, but realizing that I couldn't teach all of what I do, obviously in the studio. Uh, but <clears throat> I was in the, in, in the mode of wanting to create something that after a while that okay let's let's stay in this space and so I called it joy in motion because you know there were certain exercises that really seemed to render people into a different neurobiological chemical state that they they showed a lot of joy and you know I remember taking screenshots of people just you know beaming yeah uh, and so yeah so we called it joy in motion yeah and, that's that's lovely um yeah. yeah i mean the the pandemic was so hard for so many people and but there are also these little bits of joy or connection that was that happened that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise mm -hmm. so it's, it's good to re remember that as well and, um yeah and i also just out of that class i then started to offer a class within my university setting which was for staff and faculty, which was put um, was programmed by the Susan Samwelly Institute for Integrative Health, and again, you know, offer staff would talk about how it it shifted their mental states and mm -hmm. produced a feeling of of reduced stress and and possibility. Um, you know, again, rendering their their imaginations into the space, and so. That then begat a study. So we have a study now that we're working on using the same concepts that we use in this virtual space, but this one's for students. This is students that are in STEM, mm. working with minoritized students in STEM. And we're just at the uh, end of the first phase of that. So it's a pilot study. And so we'll see what, what the outcomes are. It's difficult to, to really measure, but, but we're on a journey to, to see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any kind of, and even if some of these measurements are not as precise as others, but as long as you get some kind of ideas of how it moves people and, and moves literally and figuratively, um, and moves them forward is, I think, really important. Um, I, I guess I want to kind of touch on some other things as well, you know, as I was kind of like looking at your websites and, and all that kind of stuff and, and curious about the jazz exchange. It feels maybe like we've already talked about some of these elements and maybe, the, maybe these were even roots of embodyology, but it seemed like a really sp more specific study or focus. And one of the things on, I don't know if this is an exact quote, but on, on the website I saw that talked about the artificial barriers between jazz and tap and break dancing or break, yeah, break dancing, contemporary African are removed since they all emit from the same creative force, the language of the drum. And I just really appreciated and, and kind of loved that that kind of like the drum is the base of the funnel and like the outcome of this practice of of drumming and embodying the the rhythm as we talked about earlier becomes all these different forms yes and i would say you know when i listen to that now i think 
yes, that's true. And so when I go back now, I reflect uh, how we spoke at the beginning. Uh, I spoke about language, right? So language comes before the drum. Mm. Um, so it's language that begets all of it. And, and language emerges out of the body, right? So movement comes before language, right? So, so the centering of rhythm that comes out of the expression of the body that begets language, right? So movement begets language. Yeah. In speech, the bronchus areas of the brain produces creative movement, and it's also related to speech. So, yeah, the, the, there is a, a centering uh, when we think about uh, the 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 instrument the instrument of the drum but now i realize that it's it's not exactly that um maybe it's then, not the, yeah it's not the base of the drum but it's like the middle it's like you have like movement becomes language becomes rhythm and then it becomes again yes. so it's like this this like this two-sided funnel type thing yes. But I was, um, I have to say that, you know, my, my journey into jazz as a, as a concert form was yeah. really inspired by working with jazz music and really seeking to rekindle that relationship between jazz music and dance, which has for the most part, for the most part been severed because of this you know, disruptive element called improvisation, which actually is the lifeblood of of the thing and the lifeblood of innovation. So, so for me, bringing the the dance back to the music required me to improvise. Required of me to engender improvisation as part of that performance. And um, and and in that journey, as I say, opening out to really understand that there's so much more than simply the beat and that sort of uh, as you 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 mentioned is a sort of not very sophisticated way for us to think about to really think about music and i think um we we in dance we've often in our need to sort of preserve our practice and seemingly these the ways the institution works and we have to be here and music has to be here, we've lost some possibility to actually, um, again, innovate together. And I would love to see in the academic sense, and in fact, I have a student right now who's really doing beautiful work with jazz musicians mm. and dancers. And she has a future that she where she will engineer that in the setting that she's in. I'm sure, I'm very sure because she's really abandoned her old approach and has really sort of set her way with new ways. And she's finding such riches there by really embracing improvisation and supporting her students to discover. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um... I kind of feel like we've kind of hit a nice kind of coming back to the beginning and 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 settled in. And I, before we end, I do want to just offer if there's anything else about about your practice or embodyology that um, that you would want to share that I that I didn't think of asking about or touching on. Is there um, anything else that you feel is like core or important to? That you want yeah, to share? Yeah, sure, certainly. So, in bodyology, it it came out of my research, my research with a group of people who have a very artful life in a village called Kopea in Ghana, and there are many other villages adjacent to it that similarly artful but this particular community um, has a, a, a drum and dance culture that is fostered by a small research space called Dagbe. And my efforts in the dissemination and the, 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 the uh, spreading, the, the sharing of this work is in recognition of that. And not simply in recognition, but as a, as a charge for me to give back to that community. So 
for me, Bodyology's um, expansion is I, I now have a teacher training program. So I'm no longer the, the sole person that can share these ideas in, in this very granular way. And I'm super excited about that. And our charge collectively, as much as they'll go in various di different directions from therapy to uh, um, K through 12 and, and medicine and, and other fields and working with seniors, right? So it, it's going in many different tangents, but that recognition is so important. It's so important because this, so often there's been a severance between what people of African descent have contributed to the world of dance, medicine, engineering, whatever field. So for me, it's really important to, to, to underscore that, to, to share that and to, to magnify that. I'm just gonna share with you one quick little rhythm that's at the center of our practice. I've got this little baby bell here. This is called Agakakui, and the rhythm that you'll learn if you ever come to a workshop. And this rhythm actually is related to speech and it means come out and see what's happening. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> that's really lovely. Well, I'm going to thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon. I know we're both busy and trying to schedule things is always a challenge, but I really loved hearing you talk more in depth about your practice and where it comes from and how it's manifesting in the world and you know, improvisation is the thing that I, I love in the world. And so I, I really appreciate you finding your own unique way of offering it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Have a wonderful day. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Ama. I hope it inspired you to look into her work and even reconsider a bit about how you think about improvisational dance. I know it did for me. Please check out the show notes for links to Dr. Ray out in the world and on the web. Please subscribe to Act React. You can find us on YouTube, Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Podbean. I hope you're able to join me for the next episode. I'll be talking with Andrew Suseno a dance artist based in New York City and the founder of Parkour Resilience and more recently Moving Rasa, which are forms of site-specific movement improvisation and inquiry that centers his hybrid experiences I had as a diaspora person of the global majority. He is also a Feldenkrais practitioner, has a doctorate in physical therapy and a certified Alaban movement analysis. So lots to talk about. Until then, take care, be well and live spontaneously.